Siddhartha, would you like to introduce Martin? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, all right. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to have uh, Martin Andler from um, Paris, Versailles, visiting, uh, he was visiting me, and, and we were hope to spend a lot more time working together until um, COVID intervened, but that's good still. It was a nice visit, and um, he's going to talk about this uh, this problem uh, that we've been working on for a while, and we had hoped to just kind of put it to bed, and we almost have barred the writing. But so I uh, thought just really, really, uh, I was really happy when he agreed to give a talk on this subject because I'd like to share it with you guys. Okay, well, th thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be back at, at Hill Center. I think I st first set foot in Hill Center uh, 34 years ago, if I count right, and with the carry over. And uh, so I'm happy to come back once in a while. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, my the initial motivation for what we're we are doing is actually differential geometry and Lie theory. Uh, in a paper published in 1950 by Henri Carton, he computed the, the equivariant. Martin, maybe you could make your um, uh, full screen. Is it possible? Well, if I make full screen, that I don't see anyone. Ah, then you don't see anybody. Okay, okay, yeah. Then please don't make it full screen. And I, I, I like to see people shouting. No, we already, we already tested. So this is actually better. So the full screen actually smaller. <laughs> I see. Okay, it's strange. Okay. <clears throat> so um, this paper of only excuse me, Martin. Small. Excuse me, Martin. I think you can make your um, seminar window slightly larger. Seminar window. Uh, because slightly. you've got you've got documents behind it. Yep, that's perfect. Even a little bit more. Uh, but you see, I mean, do you see yourselves or you don't? No, no, we do. We do. But you can go a tiny, tiny bit larger. I see. Okay. Okay. That, that's the largest I can do. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So uh, again, so Henri Carton published the equivariant cohomology of a G manifold. Uh, the thing is, the equivariant cohomology a priori is a can be defined topologically, and the idea that uh, Henri Carton developed is that it could def be defined by looking at a certain differential complex, like the Ram com equivariant the Ram complex, and it's well known actually equivariant cohomology and equivariant the Ram complex has had a big. Uh, uh, a big future um, and has been studied quite extensively and actually a book uh, 20 years ago by Gilman and Sternberg uh, uh, rephrased quite a bit of this work that had been done by Henri Carton and later by a number of other authors like Thierry Abbott, Michel Verne, a number of people. He uh, introduced uh, a, a formalism where there was a kind of supersymmetric extension of the Lie algebra G0 of G, and that this uh, supersymmetric extension acts on the, the Ram algebra of differential forms of on M. <clears throat> so, and lurking in the calculation <clears throat> is the gra Z graded, a Z graded Heisenberg Lie super algebra, and we will see how it comes in. Uh, in, in this in this computation. <clears throat> so what we we are trying to do, actually hopefully we somewhat succeeded, is that we're looking at we were working in the context of a symmetric monoidal K linear category T. The, the two is a footnote uh, uh, giving references and uh, K is a field of characteristic zero. <clears throat> well Quick reminder, but I think you had a colloquium just a few days ago about the tensor categories, so you know all about it. So T is endowed with a bifunctor, which verifies associativity, symmetry, it has a unit. And it is well known now, I mean, for instance, by Deline Milne, that many notions in linear algebra and Lie theory can be formulated in this categorical context. We have one assumption, which is about T, that it's not just any category, it's a billion, but it's also, it's locally small, it's well-powered, which means that this 
subobjects of an object as a set, it's co-complete, and tensoring by an object is the right exact functor. <clears throat> Uh, later in the talk, I will show how the super mathematics uh, dimension can be added to this categorical setting, and I will give some examples of uh, non-trivial examples, but the trivial examples are graded vector spaces, the category of graded vector spaces, graded super vector spaces, things like that. But there are some non-classical non examples too. So the cost of working in the categorical context is that you don't have elements, so you have to replace everything by diagrams, and I just gave a few diagrams. Uh, Siddhartha hates diagrams, uh, so I, I put this as a provocation uh, uh, to remind him that to do proofs, we do need diagrams. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> as I said, if in T you can look at objects which have the structure of an algebra. And one interesting thing is to study the forgetful functor from the category of modules, which is an abelian category. It's not, of course, it's not a tensor category, but it's an abelian category by a theorem by, uh, well, a theorem by Ardizoni. And the forgetful functor from mod A to T is scale linear, faithful, and exact. Uh, it, what's pretty obvious, and that's sort of classical, is that it's right adjoint to tensoring by A. That's, that's an easy result. And we show furthermore, so this is our first result, that FA creates limits, and that if the functor of V goes to A tensor V is co-continuous, then FA creates co-limits. So I'm not going to discuss these fine points of uh, category theory. What does it mean to create limits? Maybe I, I can just say that creating limits has to do with statements like this, that if you have a functor <laughs> diagram from J to mod A, and if the forgetful functor of this diagram has a limit or a co-limit, does the limit or co-limit have a structure of a module? So which means that does G have a limit or a co-limit? And this proving this involves lots of huge diagrams as the one I'm showing right now. <clears throat> okay. The second thing is, well, you can expect if you have a, a, a structure on the category, there should be a notion of a functor which respects the structure. So uh, a functor is monoidal if there exists a mor morphism from U bar tensor V bar to U tensor V bar and a morphism from the unit of the category T prime to the image of the unit of I. So it's only going, it's a morphism. The, monoidal functor is called strict if uh, if um, uh, the morphisms are isomorphism. And of course, the functor has to be compatible with the various uh, uh, constraints, associativity, community, and un unit. <clears throat> now, if we work, we want to consider modules over Lie algebra. So the first observation is that in the categorical context, enveloping algebra and the poincare birkhoff with theorem holds, and we also have the notion of induced module, all of these things work in the same way, although the proofs are substantially different. Uh, <clears throat> and we now we consider a K to be rigid, which means that it has a dual, that there is a, a dual K star, and I should add that in our notion, the, the terminology varies a bit. K star, the dual of K star is K, so K is uh, reflexive, and which is not always the case when you talk about rigid. And we are going to study the module category of K, of this rigid. We're interested in two functors, the forgetful functor from mod K to, to T, and the trivial extension functor from T to mod K. <clears throat> so uh, of course, uh, so the, for the theorem that we have is that the category mod K is itself a good tensor category. It inherits all the nice properties of the initial category. 
And moreover, the forgetful functor and the trivial extension functor are strict symmetric monoidal functors, which verifies the following properties. So, sorry, so the, the, do you assume that T is rigid, right? No, T is not rigid. Oh, so T do Just not have K. to be rigid. Okay. No, no, T is not rigid. <clears throat> only only is the not object. Good. Yeah, usually, usually T is co-complete. Okay, okay. So, but anyway. It, Huh? Okay. You have infinite so like a, yeah. objects in it. So you yeah, only need if, to assume. Only need if to you assume. have a rigid. Right. Sorry. Uh, no, no. Okay. Can I just say this? If you have a rigid uh, category, then uh, you can take its end completion. Okay. I see. So, therefore, that's the kind of uh, category we are working with, potentially. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. We want we want the enveloping algebra to be an object in the category. <laughs> uh -huh. You see that uh, the, the, the reason the reason I'm is asking that. is yeah. uh, I want to know uh, yeah, whether yeah, yeah. Okay. whether your result can be applied to the module category for vertex of algebra. So that's the reason. <laughs> yeah, I sometimes, think I think so. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it is rigid, but sometimes they are they might not be rigid. So that's the reason. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay, so again, the, the forgetful functor and the trivial extension functor, I mean, the, the first statement here is, is obvious. Uh, EK, the trivial extension functor is co-continuous and uh, it has a right adjoint, which is the functor of K invariance. So this is a way in a way of defining the functor of K invariance. We prove that EK has a right, right adjoint which one can do using categorical uh, uh, arguments and the right adjoint is the functor of K invariance. <clears throat> and the functor of K invariance, IK, is itself a strict symmetric monoidal functor. So this is our second theorem, a sort of very abstract theorems and that we are going to use later. Okay, so as I said, <clears throat> what the context that we work want to work on should include some super, super mathematical aspect. So <clears throat> we define a J category, which is a good tensor category, which is endowed with an odd unit. And an odd unit object means that J has a dual, so it's rigid. And the pairing J star tensor J to I is an isomorphism. And the second thing, the oddness is the symmetry constraint is minus one. So the symmetry constraint from J tensor J to J tensor J is minus one. <clears throat> so tensoring with J or J star induces an action of the, of the group Z on the category S. An action is, as we discovered at one point, is, is a complicated notion. I mean, Tn composed with Tm is not equal to Tn plus M. It's equivalent to Tn plus M. So you have intertwiners, which are natural, natural equivalences. You have a natural equivalence Tj composed with Tk going to Tj plus, plus K. <clears throat> so the, the typical examples of a J category is the graded vector space where the odd unit is the shifted, uh, K shifted by one, the, the uh, category of vector super spaces or the module over graded Lie algebra or over a Lie super algebra. <clears throat> but we also have some non-trivial examples like categories of sheaves over super manifold or super variety. Uh, indization of the Deline interpolation category and different categories which have been considered by different authors in the last, say, 10, 15 years. <clears throat> so now what happened in a J category? So I said that we have this action, T, Tn, and we can consider homogeneous generalized morphism. And actually, we can also consider the direct the sum the co-product of these SN, but we mostly we work with homogeneous generalized morphisms. So these are basically correspond to degree shifting morphism. <clears throat> we have a composition of homogeneous generalized morphism given by, by this formula. So you do U, you uh, 
you compose with the translate tj of v and then you have to go from tj composed with tk to tj plus k <clears throat> so one way to say it is we could say that this uh, if you consider the category with the same objects and homogene and generalized morphism you have an enriched category you, you replace the initial category by an enriched category, and the category is enriched over um, graded, uh, graded vector spaces. But we, we don't really need to go into much details about this, but there's a, a, an old theorem of Verdier uh, explaining that, this, uh, that there's an equivalence of category between categories with an action of a group and categories which correspond to this notion of generalized morphism. <clears throat> and in a J category, you have a naturally a Heisenberg Lie superalgebra, N is equal to Q plus R plus P, with P <clears throat> is a copy of J, Q, it's more convenient to have different names, Q is a copy of J star, and R is a copy of the unit. <clears throat> Now, the interesting things is that a Q module is given by generalized morphism of degree one, which verifies D composed with D is equal to one. And that has to do with the fact that, oh, sorry, D composed with D is equal to zero. And that has to do with the fact that when you do the bracket condition, because of the fact that Q is odd, you get the minus one become the plus one, and you have two two times D composed with one tensor D is equal to zero. So in terms of composition of generalized morphism, it gives exactly this. So this is interesting because what it means is that the Q module can be interpreted as being a, a complex. <clears throat> now, an N module, remember N is the heisenberg Lie algebra. So N module is given by three generalized endomorphisms, C, D, and E which verifies sort of the... Yeah. Uh, Mark, Mark, I should point out that for people who know Lie superalgebras, this Heisenberg superalgebra is also the same as SL11. Yeah, okay, yeah, right. Yes. Lie superalgebra okay. SL11, but it's some categorical version of that. And then the N module is uh, given by these three operators and three... Uh, and the generalized endomorphism would verify these various relation. And the, the interesting one is the fact that D composed with E plus E composed with D is equal to C. So the minus Lie, in the Lie algebra condition becomes a plus because of the, of the oddness uh, character of Q and of P. <clears throat> A central example of a module is the oscillator module for N. I mean, uh, there the Yale influence is very strong on the ter terminology. I would not call it the oscillator module, but uh, maybe the Schrodinger module. So we consider the double algebra, which is the symmetric algebra of P, and it's going to play a very big role in the future. So the symmetric algebra of P is I plus P because P squared in, in some sense is equal to zero. So you just, the expansion of S, S of P just stops at I plus P. And this has a, an N action. The center R acts by the entity. P acts by quote unquote multiplication and Q acts by derivation <clears throat> as given by these, these formulas. So these are very, very similar to the formulas that we're used to in the representation of the super, uh, well, actually the Heisenberg algebra and more so of the super Lie algebra. <clears throat> now we consider uh, the doubling functor, which is uh, tensoring by D, by this D. And uh, since D is kind of uh, D, D uh, quote unquote dimension, Two, D is I plus P. We can define, well, we can apply the doubling functor to a given Lie algebra, which is fixed for the, you know, for the rest of the talk. And we define the double Lie algebra L prime, which is D tensor L zero and it's equivalent. It's uh, isomorphic to L zero plus PL zero. PL zero being an abbreviation for P tensor L zero. <clears throat> And now we can consider the extended double the al algebra. Uh, well, Martin, maybe we should point out that this is just a change of ring functor. S of P yeah, is a right. commutative ring. 
So you have a Lie algebra and then you tensor it with the ring, you get another Lie algebra. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a change of scalars. Yeah, I mean, D is a change of scalars. And we can consider the double Lie algebra, double algebra L. So as I said, Q acts on D from previously. So if Q acts on D, it acts on D tensor L0. So we get an action of Q on L prime, and this defines an, ex uh, as an extended semi-direct product, which is L is Q plus L prime. <clears throat> and the doubling functor, again, because it's a change of scalars, it restricts to a functor from mod L0 to mod L. <clears throat> So if I take L0 is equal to zero, then L is equal to Q. So the doubling functor goes from the category S to the category of Q modules. The more interesting example is that uh, if L0 is I, the abelian unit algebra, uh, then L, the L is actually equal to N because L prime is I plus P and then you add Q. So it's Q plus I plus P. And it's very easy to check that this is. Uh, <clears throat> so this uh, double extended double algebra is a kind of, it's a horrible uh, word, Heisenbergization of L0. It's uh, transforms, uh, it's a kind of Heisenberg quote unquote extension of L0. <clears throat> Okay, so now we have the, the tools that we, we want. We have, if we have a Q module, we can, it's defined by differential dx. So we can consider the corresponding cohomology, define the, uh, <clears throat> the kernel of D uh, over the, uh, the boundaries, uh, the same definition. And if we have an L module, then we can consider the L prime invariance in the L module, Y of L, Y L prime. So that's the L prime invariance. And then you can consider now you get a Q module because L, L prime is, a, is an ideal. And so you can consider the, this uh, cohomology HQ. <coughs> and you can have a quote unquote equivariant version of this cohomology by tensoring by with an L algebra. <laughs> And so what we're going to get is results about this, uh, this cohomology. <clears throat> so the first elementary result is that HLA is a monoidal functor. <clears throat> if- so, Sorry, maybe, uh, I don't know if you're going to point out, but this abstract thing is really, uh, for a special choice of A, is really Cartan's uh, uh, definition of equivariant cohomology. So it became very simple, kind of almost slipped under the rug, but you know, <laughs> it generalizes that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it's really sort of mimicking. I mean, what we're doing is mimicking in this categorical context this construction with a with a general i mean a, a general uh, uh, not not just mimicking but generalizing you know so it's, it's as general more general than the cartan thing yeah yeah more general yeah sure and actually eventually if uh, we will we will give some interesting examples of this i mean in 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 a concrete concrete situation <clears throat> So I, if, uh, if you apply a monoidal functor to, uh, to an algebra, you get an algebra. So if B is an, is an algebra, HLA of B itself is an algebra. And if V is a module, HLA of V is an HLA of B module. <clears throat> we can show that the morphism of L algebra induces a natural transformation from HLA to HLA a prime. And then we can define the notion of homotopy, which is uh, a morphism. So it's a homotopy between L morphisms, which is an L prime morphism, which verifies this homotopy condition. <coughs> and we denote, we write the homotopy with this notation. <coughs> 
And we say that two model L morphisms are said to be homotopy inverses if GF is, is equivalent to one X and FG is equivalent to one Y. <clears throat> And a quasi isomorphism is a is a mod L algebra morphism which admits a homotopy inverse, but it, the homotopy inverse need is not an algebra morphism, just no homotopy inverse. So here now we can state the the main the main theorems. <clears throat> so we assume that A is an L algebra and possibly commutative L algebra, then HLA is a monoidal functor, as this I've already said, from mod LA to S. An L algebra morphism from A to M prize induces a monoidal natural transformation from HLA to HLA prime, which is given by this, this, uh, this formula. And the central result here is that if, a, if it, F is a quasi isomorphism, then tau F is not only a natural uh, uh, isomorphism, but it's actually an equivalence of functors. <clears throat> so if we have, again, if we have A and A prime, which are, which are homotopy equivalent, then it induces an isomorphism on the, on the cohomology. The second main theorem, which is a generalization of the Kozul theorem, <clears throat> we take x0 to be an L0 module. So we could take dx, which is its double, it is an L module, and we write, we consider the symmetric algebra, the symmetric <clears throat> algebra of dx and the tensor algebra of dx. <clears throat> so the unit map going from I to T of dx the two and or from I to S of dx are quasi isomorphisms. And in both cases, the homotopy inverse is the augmentation eta. So here we do have two algebras for which we have these quasi isomorphism. <clears throat> then the next theorem, any two mod L morphism from T of Tdx, Sdx to y, <coughs> which agree on the un unit are homotopic. <coughs> uh, a bit later, uh, at one, at one p.m. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I, I'm being kicked out of my room, but I negotiated that I could stay until one. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, so these are these uh, three theorems are our main theorems of this paper. And now I'm going to, so actually the talk is going to be short. I was quicker than expected. Uh, so this, these theorems have corollaries, which were previously known, they're, they're not results. The first one is we can consider a, the category of super vector spaces over C. And we consider a complex uh, Lie algebra G0, and we consider V0 to be a purely even G0 module. <clears throat> then consider uh, the tensor product of the symmetric algebra of V0 tensor the uh, exterior algebra of V0, and which is what Gilman Sternberg called the Kozul algebra, and it has a differential which is given on generators of the form x0 tensor one dk is the differential zero, whereas uh, on, uh, on the exterior uh, generators, it goes to the symmetric generators. <clears throat> well, the theorem, which is uh, in Gilman Sternberg's explains, or it's a generalization that the complex is an acyclic resolution of the ground field C. <clears throat> so this extends a results of Gilman Sternberg to the G0 equiv equivariant case. It was, he didn't, there was no G0 and also to the coadjoint module V0. So if we consider the coadjoint module V0, maybe it's, uh, uh, it's, <clears throat> 
uh, relevant to notice that K, K of V0 is then K of G star. So it's S of G star tensor lambda of G star. So this is called what the V algebra, but in super terms, this is the symmetric algebra of the double algebra of, of the double of G star. <clears throat> so we are really close to the formalism in, in Carton's work or in Gilman Sternberg's work. <clears throat> the second classical result that we that is a consequence of our of our result is that you consider a G0 uh, a Lie algebra, then we consider the, the this resolution of, of C by, by these uh, guys with the where eta is the augmentation and we have a differential dn given by uh, the usual usual formula. So this uh, sequence is exact. So we do have a, a, <clears throat> a resolution. So I think I'm going to stop here. So we have quite a bit of time for, for the discussion. I was too quick. Uh, I didn't want to give too many details, but then uh, it was it worked too well. Uh, uh, so maybe we we can answer questions, or maybe Siddhartha wants to make some comments or compliments. And uh... yeah, I, I want to make one. Uh, 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 yeah, just I want to make one point. Maybe Volodya would remember this. Uh, could you go back to the theorem where you had the tensor algebra? This one or the Kozur? Or yeah, yeah, right, right here. So you you explained the thing with the symmetric uh, algebra of the double, but yeah. there is the same statement is also true for the tensor algebra. And um, this, in the classical situation, it's some work of Gelfand and um, a student of his whose name I'm forgetting. Uh, Volodya, can you hear me? I don't know if Volodya is here. But Jim, perhaps you remember who who was this student of Gelfand's when he first came? Uh, mm, I'm trying to remember. Uh, they wrote a paper that appeared in you know um, this uh, this volume, maybe the first uh, Gelfand seminar volume that was. And the guy then eventually he was I think he was at Princeton, but he was doing his PhD with Gelfand. Oh, um, yeah. I I think I co-edited that volume, so let's see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, okay, so I just wanted to point out that the tensor, huh? Smirnov? Yeah, some Russian guy, right? I forget, you know, he went to Colombia, I think. Smirnov, maybe. I was supposed to remember. Yeah, yeah, you, you were a co-editor, so it's fine. But anyway, so this tensor algebra result generalizes that. Gelfand Smirnov, right, maybe? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I just checked, I think so, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The algebra of Chern Simon's classes, the Poisson bracket, and the Grage group action on it. So this, yeah, this is a gen sorry. This is generalizing that in the tensor category setting. So you you here you start with just a, a um, tensor category. Um, so everything works in a tensor category. So how about uh, like a braided tensor category? Uh, anything, anything you can use the braiding to do anything. Well, we, we've been working in the symmetric case, right? So uh, the braided case, I, yeah, I, I, okay. we haven't ventured in that, but maybe maybe there is something, maybe there is something to, to do. Um, <clears throat> I, I, we haven't thought about it, but uh, about the braided case, um, we can still have. I mean, our program has quite a long few things to do next. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. as applications of this formalism, because we definitely want to go back to the, and we, we 
I mean, we have to write it up, but we have results about uh, which generalize this. No, I mean, results in uh, equivariant cohomology and the universality of the Vey algebra and uh, things like that. So this, this will. So there are some applications in differential geometry, which, which I think is kind of new. I mean, it's known that you could do algebra in with tensor category. I don't think it was well seen that you could do differential ge geometry in the context of tensor categories in the uh, categorical context. <clears throat> yeah, the, the reason I'm asking is because um, uh, for us, actually, the uh, the the braiding is quite important because um, the uh, the the when we consider module, see that for vertex algebra we do have a braided tensor category, and then we the for the module um, for vertex algebra it is actually some kind of a special module, uh, not a general module in the as algebra in the category, so the module. Is satisfy some particular property related to the uh, the braiding, and uh, if you consider the tensor category module, then it will actually include all those um, all those like a twisted module together. So because the, the twisting is related to the braiding, so it will be very interesting if uh, um, this type of thing can be done for for the uh, braided tensor category. Then it will be one will be able to apply to to the uh, vertex operator. I'd be very happy to discuss the issue. <laughs> yeah. So the, the the main thing that uh, even for vertex operator module, the the for me the main thing is interesting. This if you have a uh, algebra in the tensor uh, uh, algebra in the tensor category of some modules, some of some small smaller vertex operator. Then um, you consider all the modules for this algebra. Um, it will actually contain all kinds of uh, twisted modules, and so the uh, the sort of the braiding determines the different type of twisted modules. So that will actually be interesting to, to see how this kind of formalism can can be used to, to study twisted module because twisted module, the whole theory is not well developed yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, I will not be able to discuss it live with you, but maybe uh, Siddhartha could do it, or maybe I'll come back at one point. Yeah, so, so I would be interested in seeing uh -huh. um, developing this type of a theory. Mm -hmm.